Hello and welcome to session three in the Summer Scripture School, uh, my third lecture in this series on Jesus as the Servant of God in the Gospel of Matthew. And now in this um, lecture, the intention is to focus on the Gospel, on the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. In particular, we're going to say a few words about the baptism of Jesus and its importance, and then the lead into the ministry and the Sermon on the Mount. And a particular focus will be on a term that I think is essential for getting a grasp of who Jesus is, especially in his role as servant um, in the gospel. And that term is righteousness. It can be translated by, as we will see, uh, a lot of different words. And, but it's a key term, and we'll take a little bit of time to consider it and how important it is as Jesus begins his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. So let's get into our text and begin to consider uh, where we're going now today. Um, the preparation for the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew uh, really begins, uh, I suppose you'd say, at the beginning. Right from the start, the focus is on the identity of Jesus. So with the infancy narrative, um, with the beautiful genealogy that is very cleverly constructed, not particularly historically accurate, couldn't be in the shape that it's in, but it does seek to show that Jesus is rooted in, as we've seen, the, the, the history of the chosen people. He is a son of Abraham. He is the son of David. And he is of the house of, of David. Uh, his, his uh, stepfather, Joseph, takes him as his son, we are told in, in, chapter, in chapter one. So he is of the house of David. But the, the emphasis here with the titles, Jesus as the Messiah, in verse one of chapter one, Jesus as the son of David, as we've said, uh, spoken of as the son of God um, and servant. That emphasis is key because it helps Matthew's Jewish readers situate this person, situate him as the fulfillment of their hopes. Not an afterthought, not some dramatic, dramatic new departure, but quite the opposite. He is the one we've been preparing for. He's the one the scriptures point to. And crucial to that is, of course, the nature of Jesus' relationship with God. And that's what we'll explore, especially in the baptism story. Jesus' relationship with God explains his, his faithfulness to God's project, to this idea of the kingdom, God's reign, God's will for the world. This is God's will, and Jesus is committed to it. And all of that is being prepared for in these chapters. One thing, again, worth reminding ourselves of here when we use the language of the Son of God, we're not using the language of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, at least not at this stage in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew doesn't understand that language. That's a language that will emerge as people in the church grapple with the questions of identity and will, of course, emerge officially in the creed uh, the creedal formulations that we know from the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, that's going to take three centuries. So we need to bear it in mind. That's not Matthew's world. Um, and we shouldn't allow it to, uh, how would I say, influence in a negative way a reading of the text. What I mean by that is, if from the very beginning, we see Jesus as revealed as the second person of the Blessed Trinity, then we go off on a different tangent, one that doesn't embrace what Matthew is at. So we have to allow for that other understanding to emerge later, as it does, and that's, that's very good and right. But let's stay with Matthew and how Matthew understands what's going on. Oh. The story of the baptism of Jesus, it comes, of course, immediately after the infancy narrative. We go from Jesus as the child born in Bethlehem, who then is brought to Nazareth and who grows up there. Um, 
and we suddenly move to a completely different scenario and we're in the story of John the Baptist. And of course, John is crucial in the gospel story, he's crucial as the forerunner to Jesus. That's how he is presented. But again, it's useful for us to remember that in first century Ju Judaism, John was a very important, distinct figure in his own right. And indeed, um, he's spoken, spoken about in texts and sources outside the Gospels. Josephus, the Jewish historian in particular, speaks of him much more than he speaks about Jesus. So John's role there was important. But for the early church, John's role is completely, uh, how do we say, subjugated to um, the role of Jesus. John is depicted for the early church as a new Elijah. Elijah in the Jewish tradition was expected to come again. Because in the Old Testament story, as we know, Elijah was taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot. He didn't die, which is very unusual, uh, especially in the Old Testament. He disappeared into the heavens. And the question then arose around those texts was, well, what's, what, what happened? Well, where is he? What's he doing? And the tradition arose, well, he's there because he's going to come back when it's the time of the Messiah. So there were traditions around that. And John the Baptist then is seen as a new Elijah. And that's shown by the way he is depicted in the Gospels. His strange clothing and his strange diet echoes the behavior of Elijah in the, books of, in the book of Kings. John stands in that prophetic tradition. He's calling the people to repentance. And in the Old Testament, repentance was very much revolved around the verb to return. Shuv to return, to repent. So it had the physical notion of kind of turning around or going back to God. In the New Testament, however, the language, which of course, as the language of the New Testament is, is in Greek, um, and the word that uh, expresses repentance is metanoia. And that is a different concept. It doesn't involve the idea of turning around or, 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 or movement. It rather, has the idea of a change of mindset, of uh, seeing differently. And that change of mindset, that seeing differently then would lead to a change of behavior. And so John is depicted here in uh, chapter three as in the line of the prophets, in the line of um, Elijah and Isaiah indeed. He's calling the people to repentance and the people are coming out. The people are responding to the urgency of his message, to the, the drama that he presents. And it's interesting that when they come to him, especially the people who will feature in the ministry of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who are Jesus' opponents, John is immediately here uh, in conflict with them, warning them. And warning them, interestingly, that they shouldn't, be relying on the notion that we have Abraham as, as our ancestor and therefore we're saved. John says to them, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. So the idea of being in relationship with God is nothing to do with ethnicity. It's nothing to do with where you're from. It's to do with where your heart is and your response to God's call. Hence the need for this repentance, see differently. Um, and of course, he speaks then about the one who's coming and who will baptize the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus um, comes along and we have this very unusual incident where um, John is shocked that Jesus would seek baptism from him. He says, I need to be baptized by you. And yet you come to me. But Jesus answered, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented and Jesus is baptized. So that crucial phrase, fulfill all righteousness, is very important for giving us an insight into what is unfolding in the gospel, the fulfillment of all righteousness. Righteousness is a key term in the Old Testament. Um, in terms of describing a, an attribute of, of Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. God acts in the Old Testament out of a sense of his own zudachah, 
is the Hebrew word zedekha. And it's this zedekha that God has that makes God want to save his people. It's this zedekha that makes him want to free the Israelite slaves in Egypt who that wants him to, to uh, bring that people to himself, to form them, to guide them, to lead them. So it's a key covenant attribute of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And we're going to return to that in, in the slide after next, um, because it's it's crucial that we understand righteousness as a, as a base from which um, both Jesus operates and the, the, the call that he is offering to his disciples. But before that, we just think about the, the, what immediately follows. Jesus is baptized. And we have this dramatic moment where God speaks. God speaks with this simple sentence in Matthew 3.17. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And there, with one simple sentence, the evangelist links Jesus' identity to key uh, Old Testament figures linked right into the story of the covenant. So, for example, in Psalm 2, we celebrate, uh, or God celebrates, uh, the king, the, the Judean kings, who are the descendants of David. In Psalm 2, God speaks to the king and says, You are my son, son of David, my anointed one. Then in the book of Genesis, Abraham has longed for his son. His son is Isaac. And then God calls Abraham in chapter 22 and tells him to take his son, take your son, your beloved son, and go to the mountain and I will show you. So now Jesus is spoken of by God as my son, my beloved son. And that very um, poignant moment links what's going to happen to Jesus because in the Jewish tradition, Isaac was willing to be sacrificed. They reflected long and hard on the story of Genesis 22 in the Jewish tradition and they saw Isaac as being a willing partner. Jesus, in his relationship to the Father, will be willing to be offered. He will go to the cross for the sake of the reign of God. So here, a link is being made uh, with Jesus and his, his connectedness to the Jewish story, the story of the people of Israel. And also, of course, then in uh, the servant song in Isaiah that we've already alluded to, there God speaks of the servant describing as my chosen one in whom I delight, in whom I am well pleased. So now we have in this opening moment, before Jesus' ministry gets underway, the voice of God declares Jesus' identity, ties him to the story of God's faithfulness in the scriptures. And now Jesus' faithfulness, immediately after this incident, Jesus' faithfulness to God's project, to the kingdom, will be tested. Because as the people of Israel were tested in the wilderness, so now Jesus as a kind of perfect embodiment of the people of Israel, finds himself in the wilderness and tested. Tested not to go the way of the covenant. Tested to seek other options. In fact, in the last talk of this series, I, I, I come back to the idea of what those temptations really mean because I think they give us a wonderful insight and can help us understand the notion of servanthood and how we can participate in that as disciples. Well, we'll return to that uh, in the last lecture. So, where does that bring us? Well, it brings us to this moment when we want to consider this idea of righteousness. See, um, I don't know, I suppose we hear words differently. Um, the term righteousness I don't like at all. Um, I suppose that my own mind, um, I associate it with self-righteousness, which is unfortunate. But of course, self-righteousness is something uh, that is can be easily attributed to people of a religious persuasion, persuaded of their own uh, goodness or their own uprightness. And from that, 
then height, they consider themselves superior perhaps to others. And of course, righteousness in the scripture has nothing to do with that. Um, the term, as I've already mentioned uh, in Hebrew, is zidakha. And in the Bible, we have uh, two sides of this term. We have God's righteousness, God's zidakha, and ours. And what I'm hoping to do now in the next couple of slides is just take examples that help to illustrate this, because I really do think it's important to get a handle on this concept, because it will help us understand the Sermon on the Mount and then help us understand the call to discipleship but also the ministry of Jesus and what he is working out of. So God's righteousness is, as we have noted, this manifestation of the covenant faithfulness of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And we'll see now that it's frequently used in parallel with um, key terms that we find in the Old Testament, such as steadfast love, which is chesed in Hebrew, and another term faithfulness, emuna. So the God of Israel, in acting towards his own people, in calling them into covenant, is, is motivated by love, by desire for faithfulness. There's no um, other agenda. There's no um, attempt to, to say that uh, this idea of righteousness is can be measured in human terms, uh, as for example, it's sometimes called translated by justice. Look at it that way. The term is sometimes translated with the word justice, but the justice of God does not relate to human courts or human law. The justice of God derives from God's sense of who God is and what God wants, and that's beyond our understanding in terms of love and mercy and reaching out to broken humanity. Now, the other side of that then is clearly found in the Old Testament also, that human righteousness, human beings when called into a relationship with God, with God, are expected then to, to respond, to have a sense of who God is and to respond then with the appropriate action moral action that reflects our relationship with this God. Now, the difficulty for us from a semantic point of view is highlighted when we consider the term zidakha uh, in the New Testament then is translated in the Greek with the Greek word dikaiosune, righteousness. And we know that's a very important term for Paul. Now, Paul using it slightly differently from Matthew. We don't need to go into that here, but um, but it's interesting to note that in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, if you were to go through all the occurrences of the term Zedekah in Hebrew, you would find texts in various texts that the term is actually translated differently. So I did a quick sweep um, through uh, Old Testament um, texts that use the word Zedekah. And there's what I discovered, that the same word, zirika, is translated, in, depending on the context, by saving deeds, righteousness, which is probably the most common one, and the one that we see most often in the new Revised Standard Version. That's the translation many people are using nowadays. And so that's, that's a common translation, but not always. We don't always translate it the same way. So it's translated with righteousness, but also with vindication, God's vindication. God's justice, that's the preferred translation that you find in the New Jerusalem Bible, uh, which is used in, our, in the Catholic liturgy. It is also sometimes translated by the term victory, God's victory, uh, uh, also salvation and deliverance. So, and those aren't all the possible translations. There are other ones, but I, I, I give those as a kind of a flavor to see what, what we're dealing with here. This term is crucial but it's, it's not easily defined. It's an attribute of God. It's about the grace of God. It's about God's activity on our behalf. Um, and that's crucial that we, we get a handle on it. So if we look at some Old Testament texts that might illustrate that for us, um, we hear some texts in, in the prophets where um, 
uh, the where do we see now? Oh no, we don't want to do that. We go back. Where? Let me see. Can I move that picture? So that, no, it won't go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. No, we'll ignore that. <laughs> I just want the the screen to be clear. But the text. As it stands, shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down justice. Let the earth open, that salvation may sprout, sprout up, and let it cause righteousness to sprout up also, for I, the Lord, have created it. So here we have in Isaiah 45, this, this uh, outpouring from God, of a gift and that the skies rain down using the word justice mishpat but then also saying let the whole creation earth open up that salvation may sprout up and let it cause righteousness so what we have there's a kind of a parallelism salvation god's desire for our well-being is also expressed by the term zedekah god wants that to spread up he wants it to be uh, part and parcel of our experience. God has created this. Also, then in the next chapter in Isaiah, I bring near my justice, my righteousness, it is not far off, and my salvation, there already, the term is twinned again with the idea of salvation. It will not tarry. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. And then another example here from Jeremiah, their text. Thus says the Lord, let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord, that in other words, that I am Yahweh. I act with steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight. So this is who God is. God is Zadik, God is the righteous one. God acts with righteousness. It's an expression of his love, his love, his mercy, his desire to save. We find it in, in the Psalms, similarly. Psalm 36, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the cloud. So they're chesed and emunah as I mentioned. Your justice or your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the deep. You save humans and animals alike. So it is an expression of the way God works all the time in his creation. And in Psalm 40, the psalmist has had experience of this. And he says, the psalmist shares this prayer, and he says, I have not hidden your saving help is how it's translated in some uh, examples, Psalm 40. I haven't hidden your saving help or your justice, your righteousness within my heart. No, I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. So I hope these texts are, are getting across the point of how this righteousness term, this idea is an expression of who God is, what God wants in terms of grace, the goodness of God the desire of God for our salvation, our well-being, that we might know ourselves loved. And that in turn, of course, evokes a response from human beings. And we get that also in the Psalm. Um, so here uh, we have Psalm, um, Psalm 112. And this is a good text for, for considering this. Um, can I move that? Yeah. It's not going. We stay where we are. So praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. In other words, their righteousness, their 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 moral uprightness endures. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. So they act with their life shows forth the goodness of God. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They're not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They won't be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. For they have distributed freely. They have given to the poor 
their righteousness endures forever. They have been faithful to the covenant and therefore have shown themselves righteous. So you see there as a, as a, as a human response, it's related to the righteousness that is in God, but expresses itself then for human beings in their action. Okay, righteousness is key. And this then sets up where, where we are now for uh, the beginning of the ministry. Because what we find here is that Jesus is uh, depicted as fulfilling a scripture. As the ministry begins, uh, Matthew quotes a beautiful text from Isaiah describing the situation. What is unfolding now as Jesus sets out and embarks on his proclamation of the reign of God. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. So Jesus uh, is the fulfillment of that. Jesus is the light of God, as John's Gospel say, the light of the world. This is what is being fulfilled as Jesus begins to proclaim, repent, metanoiate, repent and believe that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Here's the summary of the gospel. Repent and believe, trust in the fact that now the reign of God, the reign of heaven has come near. Matthew will constantly speak of the reign of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Simply because, I think as we noted, it's a way of avoiding the name of God. In keeping with Jewish tradition, you don't use the name of God lightly. So you speak of heaven when you want to avoid uh, the term kingdom of God. So kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God means the same thing. Um, and what does this mean then as Jesus proclaims this is his message? Well, he went throughout Galilee doing three things. Teaching. It's the first thing, teaching, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Good news in the Bible, gospel, is found in the Old Testament, and it's the good news of God's will and God's presence. You find it in Isaiah several times. And the good news is God with us, Emmanuel. The good news is God's intention to save. So we're proclaiming now the good news of the reign of God. And alongside that, and part of it is that he cures every disease and every sickness among the people. So Jesus comes with this good news of the kingdom and he comes to the afflicted masses. He comes, he comes to suffering broken humanity. And the people then respond, they, they bring to him all those who are sick, afflicted with diseases, pains, the demoniacs, the epileptics, the paralytics, and he cured them twice their cure. Heal. I mentioned earlier, healing is an important verb in Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. It is part of the righteousness of God that God reaches out to us in our plight, in our in our broken state. And from there begins then the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is, is crucial, of course. Um, this is where Matthew, right at the beginning of his gospel, packs into just uh, these three chapters, core teaching of what this kingdom that Jesus is speaking about, what it represents, what it means. And so the, the, um, the story begins with Jesus going up a mountain, echoes of Moses going up a mountain. But here Jesus isn't come, going to get a new law. Jesus does not promulgate a new law here. In the way Moses took a law from God and brought it back. Jesus here promulgates an interpretation of Torah, which is teaching. Torah, uh, which is translated as law, in the Hebrew actually means teaching, instruction. Jesus instructs primarily at the beginning here with the, the, the Beatitudes, who God is. And then the consequence for us, consequences of that identity of God for us in terms of how we respond. So here then righteousness comes into its own. 
the Beatitudes that we know are an expression of God's righteousness, his Zedekha. But then in the sermon you have a teaching on the righteousness that should emerge from us in response. You have heard how it was said, thou shalt not, but I say to you. So a reinterpretation of Torah and law, a reinterpretation of our attitude to prayer and the relationship with God, a reinterpretation of the way we relate to one another at every level, completely transformed by an awareness of who God is. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, is how it's summed up in 548. And in the middle, of course, of that whole sermon, we have the section on the sermon uh, on the Our Father. I might return to that in the, in the last talk. Okay, so then there we have the Sermon on the Mount. It's crucial because it's a presentation of the righteousness of God, as well as our response to that. So we just now I want to say a little bit about the, the, the Beatitudes. Uh, we are used to the Beatitudes, we're familiar with them, but they, uh, they're not simple in one way, because they seem to invite a situation of, well, are they inviting a strange passivity in the face of, of, of evil? What are they saying about God? What does it mean to say, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst? What's that about? Well, I'm going to suggest that these first four Beatitudes are pointers to the situation that God seeks to change. God isn't offering us a set of virtues here to be imitated. And sometimes I think, especially the first one can be viewed in that way. Poor in spirit can be used as the idea that uh, if you're poor in spirit, it means you, you, you have developed a, a trust in God the parents of those who trust in God and nothing else. That, of course, would be a wholesome thing. But in terms of the overall sermon, I think what is happening here is the parents spirit in the Old Testament are those people who have, in a sense, been crushed. They've been crushed by armies and systems, uh, empires that have visited Israel and crushed the people. Their spirit is broken. And ironically here, the evangelist is telling us, Jesus is telling us in the kingdom, they are the blessed ones because God cares about them. God cares about those who mourn. We mourn at the state of the world and the mess it's in. who are not happy that it should be so because they know it's not what God wants. Blessed then to are the meek, those who have been, let's say, walked over, who have been on the receiving end. Blessed are they. Because God will grant them what has been taken from them. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for Zedekha. The Zedekha that is proper to God, that is the expression of who God really is, the expression of God's love, God's mercy, God's justice. They will be filled. And the second four Beatitudes can speak to. Um, those of us who are called to work for the kingdom are blessed because we um, seek to bring about the, the reversal of the situation outlined in the first four. So blessed are the merciful, for it is the mercy of God in us and working human beings that will bring about transformation, that will put an end to oppression. Because mercy is root rooted in compassion. It's the same idea. Blessed are the pure in heart, those who are single-minded in their devotion to God and what God wants. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. Peacemakers, those who work for the shalom that God offers. That is harmony and wholeness. Blessed are those then who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Those who pursue the righteousness of God, that is proper to God, work for God's compassion, concern for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, theirs is the kingdom. So what we have in this outline here with Jesus speaking at the beginning of the sermon is an expression of the mind of God and his desire for us. And it is radical, it is transformative, and it is at odds absolutely with so much 
um, of our own cultural, economic, political, even religious practice. It turns the world's values on its head. So what's going on here? We'll just finish with this. What's going on here is that with the sermon, Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, he's not simply a new Moses, but rather with the authority that belongs to him as God's son, as explained earlier, he imparts in the sermon a new and a definitive interpretation of Torah. What God wants, what God offers and expects. So everything that Jesus commands or requires here derives from a distinct theological vision of who God is. And this sermon and its content and its demands can only make sense in the light of that vision. A vision that rests on the character or nature of God as revealed by Jesus. If we took the sermon on its own and divorced it from the ministry of Jesus and all the things that Jesus did, it would might just be an impossible dream. But when we link it to what he did and how he reached out to people, then it begins to make sense. The righteous, those who live by righteousness, are those who long for the coming of the kingdom, a kingdom revealed in the ministry of Jesus who long for the vindication of right that will come with it, God's order, and who, on the basis of this hope and this longing, actively do God's will now. That's the righteousness that is proper to uh, the Sermon on the Mount and to the life of a disciple. We'll continue with our reflection on the ministry of Jesus, in particular how these kingdom words in the Sermon on the Mount then become expressed in kingdom deeds in what immediately followed, and that'll be the content of our next our next lecture. Thank you for being with me today. <laughs>